Uh, good afternoon, Newfound Wisconsin. Uh, my name is Jack Barlow, and I teach politics at Juniata College. I'll have my fellow judges introduce themselves, and you'll introduce yourselves, and then we'll get started. Go ahead, uh, Judge Draper. My name is Lindsay Draper. I am currently Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of the Institute for Wellbeing and Law. And I am Robert Allison. I am a history professor at Suffolk University in Boston. And would you introduce yourselves and your teacher, please? Well, good morning and good afternoon. We are Unit 2 from Wauwatosa West High School. I am Nora Rommelfanger. I am Rachel Lavelle. I'm Mackenzie Jacoby. And I'm Nora Ingring. And we are here on behalf of our mentors, teachers' assistants, and teacher, Mr. Chad Metesky. Okay, very good. So I'm going to read the question and we'll get started. We are a little bit behind time here. So uh, question one for unit two. What were the major disagreements among the 55 delegates during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and how were they resolved? What issues, if any, were not resolved and what were the consequences? What changes, if any, should be made to the Constitution? Please begin. At the Annapolis Convention, a draft of the report made to the states declared, render the situation of the United States delicate and critical, calling for an exertion of the united virtue and wisdom of all members of the Confederacy. The Annapolis Convention served as one catalyst for the Philadelphia Convention after the Articles of Confederation proved to be unsustainable as issues such as Shays Rebellion arose regarding the economy, taxes, and a near impossible amendment process. Although the Philadelphia Convention's original purpose was to revise the articles, this was soon seen as unrealistic. An initial conflict the delegates faced was that they would need states to compromise interests to form an effective central government. With this in mind, the proposed Virginia Plan divided power between the states and three branches of a national government. After coming out of British tyranny, delegates were especially wary of the executive branch. Because of this, delegates decided on a system of checks and balances in hopes that no one branch would overpower another. This plan also exposed disagreements on representation, producing a major debate over a bicameral legislature and representation within Congress. The Great Compromise settled this, giving the Senate equal representation, appeasing the small states, while the House of Representatives would be proportional to population, benefiting the large states. This decision ignited further division amongst the northern and southern states, eventually producing Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, known as the Three-Fifths Clause. This gave slave states more representation in the House than they otherwise would have had, while also being taxed more. In attempts to avoid further controversy, the delegates bypassed pressing moral issues of slavery. Since, to many, slavery was a necessary evil needed to hold the Union together, the delegates delayed further action until 1808, leading to the Civil War, the 13th Amendment, and modern-day systemic racism. Philosophical issues of the extent of state power also remained unresolved. The founders were unable to foresee significant events to come, so they created a malleable document, allowing for federalism to follow a pen pendulum of jurisdictional control between the states and federal government, which can be seen when comparing the presidencies of FDR to Ronald Reagan. A majority of the Constitution focused on the common good, but failed to include protections for many natural rights. Many Federalists argued to include the Bill of Rights, gave implied powers not delegated in the Constitution. However, the promise of a Bill of Rights was later essential for ratification. Among these additions was the Seventh Amendment, which defined some judicial powers intentionally left vague. One shortcoming was that there are no ways to mandate jury trials in civil cases, jeopardizing individual rights and proving costly in time and money. Amendments to the Constitution are crucial to maintaining the timelessness the founders intended. While it is important the Constitution cannot be changed easily, it is almost impossible to pass amendments. We suggest a two-thirds rather than a three-fourths majority to pass amendments in state legislatures and state conventions. Another revision we advocate for is the removal of the punishment clause from the 13th Amendment, as states are permitted to pay felons extremely low rates for labor. Due to the disproportional effects of mass incarceration on the Black and Hispanic communities, this clause feeds into the racial injustice left untouched by the delegates. This disenfranchisement of felons is a major day controversy in modern day debates on representation. Similar worries have come to light regarding the first past the post approach to electoral college. To create unity, we suggest a legislative act to establish proportional distribution among the electoral votes of the states. While debating numerous controversial topics, many delegates were forced to give up some of their ideas for others. This marketplace of ideas allowed for many compromises. 
However, as Thomas Jefferson acknowledged in the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, not everything can be addressed in a single document. Because of this concept, the delegates left room for future debate and improvement we see within the Constitution today. Thank you. This concludes our statement, and we are now ready for your follow-up questions. Thank you very much. So let's talk about uh, representation in Congress. What would you do with the Senate? Would you make the Senate a more proportional body in some way, or do you think it's fine the way it is? Um, regardless of our opinion, under Article 5 of the Constitution, we are unable to change this because it states that no state will be um, denied its um, representation in the Senate without its knowing consent, and it is highly unlikely that this will happen. So even if we have other opinions about it, this is, cannot be changed. We can see within the Virginia plan that James Madison intended the Senate to have equal representation as um, to act as a cooling saucer towards the House of Representatives. So having this equal representation would serve as a check on the House of Representatives. So I think it sh the equal representation should be maintained. Beyond this, I would argue that the 17th Amendment needs to be removed from the Constitution, as the founders intended the Senate to be the state's branch. And by giving the people the power to vote in senators, it takes some of that power away and um, further removes the Senate from its original intention. Okay, thanks. So if I were to posit to you that the original intention was a group of elitists who had very good and aspirational words and practical protections that they were willing to compromise freedoms of some of their people, ignore rights of other people. Does that change your answer at all? If I tell you, I think a bunch of elitists wrote a document to protect themselves, what do you say? I would argue that the founders were very intelligent men. However, we can see within state ratifying conventions that it was not just this, um, the founders who enacted the Constitution. And in conventions such as the Madison or Massachusetts ratifying convention, um, they actually extended it to people who didn't necessarily have voting rights at the time, such as African Americans and women, in order to get their opinion, as all people would be ruled under the supreme law of the land as found in Article 6. Some argue that the founders were, or were unjust in their creation of a brand new government, as seen with the instructions to the New York delegates, they were specifically told to amend the articles. And as seen with Hamilton, he created the Hamiltonian plan, which went directly against this. Additionally, they, they instilled Article 5, the amendment process, in order for the constitution to change with the times, because the founders understood that um, the ideals at the time of the convention would change over time. So they created this so that the constitution could act as a living document. So if I could just respond, I mean, I just want to comment about the answer that said the founders and framers were intelligent men, which struck me as fascinating considering that in some locations, New Hampshire, some places, women had been voting prior to the constitution. That, again, are you sure that this wasn't a bunch of people saying we're in control now and we're gonna keep it that way? The country was in a major turmoil as they had just come out of their British tyranny but were under the articles with very little official or national control as Shays Rebellion arose. So because of this, they needed this group of men to come in although they were somewhat of the elitist population. Um, I agree that they were an elitist population. I align myself with Charles Beard, who believed that the Constitution was an economic document. And by having this elitist society set up laws for a country that is now completely more diverse and um, expanded past what they had proceeded is unfair. As a panel of all women, obviously we would, we would have liked to see some more women representation at the Constitutional Convention. However, it's also important to consider the, where the country was in terms of pro pro progression at the time. And a document that would have allowed um, minorities and women to vote would have never been ratified due to the social circumstances. And so due to the weak state of the country at the time, I think that establishing a strong government and working to improve it down the line was a much bigger goal of the founders than to solve all of the social in inequity that was going on. While, yeah, while there were ahead. only 
men at the convention present, there were still many leading female roles, such as Abigail Adams, who had a strong influence on the convention itself and many political ideas. All right, thank you. Okay, um, you mentioned wanting to make it easier to amend the constitution. Why not just have another convention that would represent voices like yours? Um, having another convention is inherently a bad idea, as seen by the last convention, where they completely changed the system of government, which was not the intention of it at all. This could very well happen again, and we could come out with a completely new constitution or other governing body, which I believe would be a bad idea. As we can see with the balanced budget amendment, 35 states have approved to get to that position of a state constitutional or of a state convention for that. And I believe that's not inherently a bad thing if they're specifying that they're only going to work on that specific amendment. However, it's thought that with the introduction of a new constitutional convention, um, it could open a brand new can of worms that we wouldn't have even seen coming. And that's not even to say um, that we would have the secrecy rule as the constitutional convention did. There were many things present that the founders did not see coming, such as the major, the major divide between our political parties now. And to fight this, Tom, Thomas Jefferson argued for a constitutional convention every 19 years in order to keep up with these changing political trends. So I think this would be effective because there are so many things that the founders did not see coming. So what, what do you think, I mean, I, I wanna move on to judicial review here because that was something that they left out as well. Um, do you think judicial review has worked by and large and, and how do you think you might modify it if you were going to change it? I would argue that the founders had always kind of anticipated that judicial re review would be a part of the constitution. The judiciary was a part of the constitutional convention that wasn't really discussed um, super heavily and they left it sort of as a skeleton. As that, uh, they, I left article three more of this as a skeleton. So the first federal Congress could sort of lay out some more of the meat of what the judiciary would actually look like. Even as early as the first or Federalist 78, right after the Constitution, it, the thought of judicial review was brought about, and I didn't, or judicial review has been effective, and I do not think there should be anything to go against it. Judicial review is considered a, one of the major checks and balances of our federal government, and checks and balances is considered a political truth, so I think it is um, imperative that we have this still in our um, government. And this came about in the Supreme Court case of Marbury v. Madison. I find your position that putting off issues like addressing slavery in order to um, bring about the country to be fascinating as it relates to those framers. I would think the delaying the issue on the backs of some people who found themselves as slaves um, is contrary. I'm Dead gum it. <laughs> Very good job. Yep. There is no time for judge feedback. Uh, seeing that, I will stop the recording and send the judges to their breakout rooms. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.